Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, living under the bombs in Lebanon, with a new round of ceasefire talks up in the air and threats of a regional war after Israel's killing of a Hezbollah commander, people in southern Lebanon are once again caught in the middle. And so every day is a struggle. They don't know what tomorrow has in store for them. It's an extremely stressful situation. I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. I'm Sarah Salman. I'm Lebanese, but I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I'm a journalist at the AJ+. And I'm here to talk about what's been happening in southern Lebanon. Sarah, welcome to The Take. It's really good to have you here. You have been reporting on southern Lebanon, just to the north of Israel. I'm curious how living in this kind of uncertainty, under this constant threat of war, impacts people. Do people prepare for these moments, or has it become a part of daily life over time? You know, Israel has a long history of attacking Lebanon and southern Lebanon. And so people are traumatized and they carry that trauma throughout their lives. They're really used to that constant threat that exists. Now, in October, people did try to leave the South at the beginning, thinking that it's just going to last for a day or two. But by now, 10 months later, the bombardment has intensified. There are white phosphorus attacks. And since October, you have at least 95,000 people who have been displaced. And the people who are paying the heaviest price are those who are living or at least were living in border towns because right now they have been displaced. Since October 7th, there have been almost daily exchanges of fire between Israel and Hezbollah. What kind of ripple effect would a wider escalation have for the country? So it's really important to remember that these daily attacks, almost daily attacks, are happening against a backdrop of a country that's juggling a political crisis, an economic crisis, the worst in the country's history. And so... People are reeling, and this is only going to deepen these struggles. The basics and essentials, including food, is no longer affordable. A nearly bankrupt state can't provide services, and the poor can't afford to buy water. Financial collapse has sent so many people into poverty, especially the public sector. Say, people who used to make $1,000 per month are now making $100 per month. And so these people are no longer able to afford food, let alone afford places to move to. And so you have people who have told me that we've moved and we've stayed with a family member, but how long can you stay with a family member? You also have Lebanese families who were forced to move to an abandoned hotel. We are living, but the suffering is great because we are far from our hometown our family, and our siblings. You have families that are displaced in schools right now. And speaking of schools, you have children who are not going to schools. And that's 10 months of something that people thought wouldn't last that long or couldn't last that long. So I want to talk about the people there and what they told you. You've been talking to people in southern Lebanon, and one of those people is a farmer named Brahim. Can you tell me about him? So Brahim is from a town called Maisa Jabal. Maisa Jabal, according to Human Rights Watch, is one of the areas that was struck by white phosphorus. And these white phosphorus attacks and the heavy bombardment has forced Brahim and his family to leave. We had to leave because of the ongoing war here in southern Lebanon and because of Israeli attacks, especially white phosphorus, which has caused cases of asphyxiation and is impacting us, our families and children. So we were forced to leave our town and flee. And Brahim is a farmer who has a deep connection to the land like so many people in Lebanon and in southern Lebanon, where agriculture plays an integral role in society, Ibrahim, who is a new father, he moved to his relative's home. But he messaged me and he said, you know, there, 
there is a burden on other families that are hosting us and I have not had a job for 10 months. He told me we're barely able to afford food. And something that really stuck with me from my conversation with Brahim is they never went to grocery stores. They planted everything they ate. So not only do they sell the produce, but they actually directly survive as a result of living on that land. The family plants everything with their own hands and eats from the land. It's not just a business. We don't buy anything from the store. Even fruits, apples, apricots, peaches, lemon. We have a piece of land and plant all of that. And we eat from our land and our hard work. And for the white phosphorus attacks, our environment has been poisoned and it won't easily disappear. It'll need time. He told me, you know, I really want to go, but these border towns have turned into ghost towns. But he has been unable to return. His family lost their olive trees. Farmers have missed on two harvest seasons. And he's also a beekeeper. And an airstrike has completely decimated his beehives. Oh my gosh. So what does that mean for his day-to-day life? It's a daily struggle. They live day by day. They have to rely on family for survival, on community. But that's also difficult because their communities and their families and their neighbors are also struggling financially. And so every day is a struggle and they don't know what tomorrow has in store for them. It's an extremely stressful situation. After the break, how Israel's bombardment is impacting the breadbasket of Lebanon. Susara, you mentioned white phosphorus. And since October 7th, Israel has launched 175 white phosphorus attacks. I know that you've been focusing on those. What is it? And what do we know about the way that Israel has been using white phosphorus in Lebanon? White phosphorus, the use of white phosphorus is catastrophic for Lebanese people, but also for the environment. White phosphorus is deadly and it's traumatic. When it's exposed to oxygen, it can burn at more than 800 degrees Celsius. And if it gets on your skin, it can burn down to bone. Mm. And remember, It burns when it's still exposed to oxygen. So you have to add water and you have to scrape it off as the person is going through that pain. And if they are lucky and they survive, then it's a trauma that they carry for life. Under international human rights law, this should not be happening. The use of white phosphorus munitions, while not banned outright, is illegal when used in civilian areas. For Israel, it's not unusual to use such weapons. Rights groups like Human Rights Watch say this tactic is explicitly banned by international law because it's indiscriminate. You don't know where it's going to land. And when you're dropping it on residential areas, it is likely going to impact civilians. And Amnesty International also said that Israel is unlawfully using white phosphorus. Now, unlawfully because White phosphorus is not explicitly banned by international law if it's used as a smokescreen. But Israel is clearly not using it as a smokescreen. They're using it in airburst ammunition, and that is explicitly banned. They're using it as an incendiary weapon, and incendiary weapons cause severe burns, and they are traumatic. For farmers, white phosphorus has been disastrous. Their lands are burning. As I said, they have lost two harvest seasons. They have not made income this year, but also they're really worried about the long-term impact. Well, I wanted to know on that, because you, you mentioned the effects on farmers. Talk to me about the environmental impact. In southern Lebanon, a lot of people work in agriculture. And so when you are directly striking their lands, you are intentionally trying to break the relationship to that land. And that is something experts have told me, that Israel is very well aware of the impact of white phosphorus. And so they are burning agricultural lands that allow people to stay in these villages. And by using white phosphorus, 
you are trying to push these communities out. White phosphorus has right now burnt tens of thousands of olive trees. And some have told me that these are trees that are centuries old. And people are really worried about the impact this will have on the soil in southern Lebanon, which is really known to be fertile, which is why agriculture is really important in that region. Of course, based on your reporting, we know that these white phosphorus attacks are only one of the myriad of things that people in southern Lebanon are having to cope with right now. And unfortunately, this is far from the first time that they are experiencing being at the center of an international conflict. There was the Israeli invasion and occupation of Lebanon in 1982, a war between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006, now, of course, Israel's war on Gaza. When you talk to people, do they ever talk about blame? Who do they blame and who do they turn to for help? That's a really good question that does not have a straightforward answer. Because whether we like to admit it or not, Lebanon remains a sectarian country. And so the answer to that question is going to be different based on where you're at in Lebanon. For example, if you're in the South, where Hezbollah's influence is huge, then they might not blame Hezbollah. But the further north you go, people might have different opinions. What is also important to mention is that even though Lebanon is sectarian, you have a generation that wants a different Lebanon, a Lebanon where we could all meet and have a discussion about our trauma and our ongoing issues. And so who people blame really depends on where you go in Lebanon. People have very different opinions. Hmm. There are around 100,000 people who have fled their homes, as we mentioned. But there are also always going to be people who stay, who keep rebuilding and don't want to leave, even in the face of everything we've just talked about. And you often hear people in southern Lebanon being called resilient. But I wonder what you think about that word. Is it resilience that allows people to stay? Or is it also that they just don't have a choice? You know, we love to romanticize resilience and what it means. But people really want stability more than anything else. There is no doubt that people in southern Lebanon, that Lebanese people, not just in the south, they are a resilient people. But a lot of them don't have a choice, especially in border towns. One thing Ibrahim told me is, I wish the news talked about us more. Because what makes headlines sometimes is how Lebanese people are still partying or going to the beach. Well, you know, surprise, surprise, they're probably also traumatized and that's how they're coping with it because they love life, but they also want to escape it. But you have people in the South right now that can't just escape it because they're struggling to feed themselves. They're struggling to survive. They have no choice. You know, I'm Lebanese. I have friends across Lebanon and family members. And so I talk with different people. I actually spoke to someone who is a dentist. In October, her and her family left immediately. And then by December, I believe she went back to the South. I said, are you okay? Are you sure? It's really intense right now. She said, no, I don't want to be moving from one home to another. I just graduated I want to be in the South. I want to come back and work here. And I do my job, but with the sound of bombs in the background. Hmm. Wow. Sara, you and I both know that journalists never want to be the story. But it's also true that you have a personal connection to this story because, as you said, you are from Lebanon and you still have family there. What is it like to report this story through that lens because you're intimately familiar with what people are feeling. And and it's so interesting that you said, Ibrahim says he wants people to know his story and story like his. And I don't think I hear many of those stories. So talk to me about that onus that's on you to help tell those stories. I think we are going through a time we're telling these stories, whether it's about southern Lebanon or Gaza, it's a privilege because of the censorship we're experiencing. So telling these stories is really, really important. You know, as a Lebanese who lives in Washington, D.C., you know, I'm struggling to see my family go through all of this. But the people who are really struggling are the people on the ground, the people 
who are paying the heaviest price of this, who really don't know what tomorrow has in store for them and who might really be targets. Another thing that Brahim told me, and not just Brahim, actually, so many different people, is that the targets are also civilians. And that is reflective in the death rates that we've seen. Civilians have been killed, and Israel has also committed other war crimes in Lebanon. You know, they killed uh, Isam, who is a Reuters journalist. And so what Lebanese have been telling me is that Anyone is a target in Lebanon, and they want their stories to be heard. And there is a tendency to other southern Lebanon, in Lebanon, but also in the media. Mm. And, you know, that happens because Hezbollah is quite influential in southern Lebanon. But it's really important for people to remember that although Hezbollah is influential in these areas, there are civilians that are living there. There are students, there are women with dreams and aspirations, there are men who are just like you and me. And so these people are paying the price and they deserve to be heard. Their stories deserve to be told. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Tamara Kandaker, Ashish Malhotra, and Sonia Bagat, with Manah El Navid, Amy Walters, Veronique Ishaya, and me, Malika Bilal. It was edited by Noor Wazwaz. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Joe Plord makes this episode. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow.